This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Hing.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to Medicine and Health with Dr. Paul Anderson. This is a show about opening the often mysterious world of how doctors think and how science works. This program exists to educate and empower you, the listener. Now, here's your host, Dr. Paul. So, COVID, new Omicron variants, should we be panicked? Uh, should we go back into lockdown? Is there any hope? What is the new data on uh, vaccine-based immunity versus natural immunity? And uh, what are some of the updates on post-COVID syndrome? Those are the things we want to get into today here on Medicine and Health with Dr. Paul Anderson. Now, one quick note, uh, when I say that I put uh, references, resources, links into the show notes, those are on YouTube. So after we record this, it's going out live on Facebook, live on CTR Radio Network, which is my home. And we uh, obviously record this and put it over on YouTube. So on YouTube, if you're on your handheld device, you just go to the lower right corner below the video, press the down arrow or the down V, and you will see the show notes and the links. If you're on your laptop or some larger device, on the left side, there's more or show more. Click on those words, and that's where it will be. If you can't find uh, Dr. A online, DRA online on YouTube, just go to my hub website, which is dranow.com, and that will get you there. So first off, um, I have uh, been you know, watching for all of the years of the pandemic now, the, the media and what people are saying. And I, I see uh, a huge variety of healthcare uh, provider ideas and maybe advice on uh, the internet about things. And one of the things that I'm doing today as a response is a lot of people have asked me, well, geez, I'm hearing some people saying, we need to go back into you know full masking and lockdowns and all this stuff, and other people are saying no, this is just more of the same. And and these are all you know seemingly reputable medical uh, minds speaking. So what in the world's going on? So f- for example, just uh, last night I, I saw a healthcare provider uh, basically saying that um, BA the the new variants, the BA four and BA five variants of Omicron. Uh, are very dangerous, Uh, people are dying, Uh, people are being hospitalized, and we really need to get back to full masking and uh, all of the precautions that we had before. And then you've got other people saying, well, you know, Omicron is rapidly evolving in the BA and the other variants, which is true. Uh, BA5 might be a little bit more severe than, you know, the BA1 or 2 were, uh, but not by orders of magnitude. So we probably are fine doing what we're doing. And uh, it seems like those two counterpoints are just so far apart. So uh, let's talk about a couple of things. The first thing is obviously with all of COVID, people do get sick, people do die, people get hospitalized. As the variants have progressed on, we have tended to have less severity. And now with BA4 and BA5, we have even more transmissibility than we did with BA1 and 2 Omicron. So we have an increasing transmissibility. And increasing transmissibility doesn't always go with less intense disease, but usually it does. Now, uh, BA4 probably and BA5 apparently uh, have added on maybe a little bit more respiratory involvement than BA1 and 2 had, uh, some other things, and we're still kind of finding our way through what's real with that and what's not. Uh, For example, I recall when uh, Omicron first came out, um, you know, there were all these reports of, you know, mass amounts of children going to the hospital, other stuff turned out not to be true. Uh, So yes, people are going to the hospital, people do get sick, people do die but uh, that happens with every other disease every day as well. So what we have to think about is what, what's the best way to kind of look into this and approach it? And where are these messages coming from? So, and I will put a link uh, when we put this over on YouTube tomorrow, the next day, 
uh, to all of these articles. But the first one comes from uh, just a, a public news source. It's not a scientific paper, uh, but it's a nice little summary. And uh, this is from Slate um, by a writer named Tim uh, Rekarth. I hope I'm saying the name right. And uh, I, I'll just quote the beginning of, of Tim's article because it gets right to it. This week, a very scary sounding article went viral called, quote, get ready for the forever plague. And then how COVID complacency is leading to everything bad. We're all going to die, essentially. And that was uh, published on July 4th in uh, the Taiyi. And uh, they're in, the, in this paper, I'll link, there's a link to the other, uh, to that paper as well. And uh, it goes on to say, um, so they have a, a picture of a scary crow-faced plague doctor in a hoodie. And uh, there's this quote that says, one infection can destabilize your immune system and age it by 10 years. A consequence, uh, it is now possible to be re reinfected with one of Omicron's variants every two or three weeks, and each reinfection confers no immunity. Well, the first statement that uh, I would agree with that is made in this review article is none of that is true. Uh, and I see people on social media, especially uh, doing posts where they're basically saying that sort of stuff. And none of it actually is true. So I think the first thing you need to think about is there's a lot of, uh, you know, fear media going on. There has through the whole pandemic, but that doesn't make it true. And so the first thing we need to think about is, you know, what is true in this? What are the factors we need to think about? And, um, uh, you know, what's going to be the best thing? And so the first thing that this article points out, they go through why, you know, why those assertions of, uh, you know, death and destruction are not true, et cetera, which is, you know, fairly self-evident to me. Um, but it can, uh, the first thing that they say is, you know, even if you've been vaccinated and boosted, you can get infected again. Look at, you know, Justin Trudeau's had it twice. Um, many, many people who are fully vaccinated have had it, you know, once, twice, three times even. Uh, so there's, there's no longer this idea of, you know, super immunity just because you're vaccinated. Uh, and, and a lot of people are vaccinated fully for vax plus a COVID infection have got another COVID infection. So that's the state of, of where that's at. We'll get into more of that coming up here in a minute. Um, and one of the things, though, that we see with immunology and, and the, the viral progression with COVID is it's progressing. We're going to get to herd immunity or the lack of it, but it's progressing much more now like a cold virus would immunologically as far as herd immunity and all that, meaning you don't gain a lot of herd immunity to the common cold, for example. There's some, but it's not universal, right? Well, it's the same now with COVID, and that's the direction that COVID is going. It's just going to be here, but it's really not going to be a forever plague. It's just going to be like influenza where it's there, it comes back. We're just seeing a lot more of it now because we're on the front end of introducing COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, to the human race and, and letting it do its thing. Now, there's a very important thing that they bring up here, and I've brought up a few times before, and I'll put links to it. And that is that when we get infected, we have a B cell of antibody response, but also a T cell response, which appears to be more important. T cell response is part of your cell mediated immune response. And it turns out that the T cell response to a past infection with COVID is to have, you know, one variant and then get reinfected, whether you've been immunized or not, um, your intensity of infection and likelihood of being sick and dying drops uh, each time. That's largely due to um, the T cell response. And so your T cell response, let's say you got, you know, Delta, uh, COVID Delta, and then you've got Omicron. Normally, although the Omicron would be different than your Delta experience, it's, uh, it's going to be more survivable. We'll take a look at that. And the other thing that they get into is you can't really trust almost any numbers that you're hearing about, certainly not in the United States, because uh, essentially when 
uh, and, and I'm not saying this was a bad idea, but essentially when we uh, went to sending out all those at-home test kits, um, we got, the U.S. was horrible at keeping data on COVID to start with, and we got even worse because most of the people at home, even if they tested positive, are not you know, uh, logging that positive test. So, you know, so that's just sort of a, uh, the, the state of the union. But anyway, you can take a look at, at that paper. I have it linked there. But I wanted to, uh, before we get into some of the uh, details and the data around uh, infection uh, prevention with, you know, uh, with natural immunity versus vaccines and stuff, I wanted to look at another um uh, another article that was written, uh, and it was written on the uh, science page by a public health reporter. And um, this was written on, a, again, a, a public news outlet. So I'll put a link to that. But it's COVID herd immunity hasn't panned out. Uh, why are we seeing surges when most Americans have been infected or vaccinated? So what, what's going on with herd immunity? This is a really good summary. And so, you know, I don't always put the peer-reviewed science uh, only, and I like to do, you know, nice reviews that are done, et cetera. So that's part of it. Um, so an epidemiologist at Harvard, Dr. Uh, Hange, was talking about it, and he said, you know, basically it's time to update the framework around our thinking around herd immunity and SARS-CoV-2. And he goes on to say, you know, for this virus, herd immunity probably was never a realistic goal. And I know most of us, myself included, have talked about herd immunity and how do we get there. And, you know, what they're saying really um, is the problem is we put that into the public consciousness. And so now people are expecting this magic tipping point where you reach herd immunity and then people just don't get COVID anymore. And basically what the, they go on to say, based on what this, the immunologists are talking about, um, is the um, immunity we develop to the coronavirus type family and then SARS-CoV-2 is, uh, is never a complete immunity. It's not an all or nothing state. So like I was telling you before, and I'll put some links to quick videos I have on T and B cell immunity, while we build up good, a bit of good B cell and really good T cell immunity, the next time we're exposed, it doesn't mean we don't get the infection probably. We might not, but it doesn't mean we maybe 100% don't. It means that we have a better time with the next infection. And that's what they've been saying about the vaccines all along. Well, you know, this vaccine doesn't stop the infection, which is very true. Uh, now, you know, majority of the people getting infected uh, and hospitalized are already vaccinated because so much vaccination. So that that's that's still very very true there. But the bottom line with the herd immunity is um, because we have this uh, coronavirus, which uh, is uh, able to mutate very rapidly and handily. Just look at the Omicron mutations, uh, and because we have a. Uh, a non-linear immune response, you put those two things together and you just have uh, a continuous cycle of re-exposure and then infections usually at lower levels. Now, like I said earlier, a lower, uh, you know, a new, uh, a new viral strain doesn't mean it's less dangerous, but normally that's the case. Um, and so what we're dealing with now is more like you see with the recurrence of the common cold virus or influenza every year. Um, we have not and never will develop herd immunity to influenza because it mutates every year. And as you know, the uh, influenza vaccine is an estimation of what flu is coming. And those are, you know, somewhere between 15 and 30 percent you know, accurate and useful. So, you know, that's kind of the model that we're working with. They don't want you to think that, but, uh, but that's true. Now, there's a lot of talk about Omicron specific vaccine boosters. And while that is a wonderful theoretical idea, by the time the Omicron specific vaccine boosters come out, Omicron will have done one of two things or, or COVID will have done one of two things. It will either have mutated 
so far in the Omicron clades that it uh, the Omicron specific vaccines are going to help, but not that much, or it will pick up a, a brand new mutation. And so an Omicron specific booster is a really nice idea, um, but probably is not going to be terribly uh, practical. And so I think that that's another important thing. You know, if you're, we're hanging our hats on, uh, you know, specific uh, boosters and vaccine strategies and stuff, while they may be helpful to certain groups of people, maybe the elderly, et cetera, um, you're, you're not really um, going to, you're not going to immunize your way out of COVID. It's just, that's just not going to happen. And I know all of the articles I read, you know, they usually end with that. Well, just keep getting your boosters and all that. But um, that may or may not really be that helpful over the long term. Now, one of the things I am going to put in there is a, a link uh, to a uh, MD, PhD, very smart guy, Dr. Prasad, who does a lot of uh, really good data breakdowns. And he's very, very much a hard science reporting doctor, which is wonderful. So I don't need to repeat all the work he does. Um, but one of the, the one I will link is basically the punchline is, unless you're over 60 or immune compromised, there's absolutely no science that says a fourth booster is going to do anything for you. And there's also uh, really very little or no compelling science. This is not the same video, but he's got others uh, that even you know, immunizing children is going to be that helpful, okay, overall. And that's not super popular to talk about, but it's, it's basically the truth. Now, I will let Dr. Prasad through his videos, you know, enlighten you if you really need background data on that stuff. But but that's just the reality that we are uh, currently all facing at this particular point in time. So the next thing that you know I wanted to talk about then was there's always been this kind of um, question mark around, well, how much does acquired immunity help me with my future COVID infections? And remember, we can acquire immunity through two main pathways, and we can mix and match. One main pathway of acquiring immunity is uh, to have a vaccination against the disease and acquire the immune stimulation and memory that the vaccination creates for me. So that is very uh, kind of the classic thing for acquired immunity. But the other is uh, I could just get the disease and acquire the immunity as well. You know, sort of like, um, you, you know, you can, you know, back all those years ago when I was a child, um, you know, we, we tended to actually get a lot of childhood diseases because there, there was not immunization strategies and uh, we would have to live through them and then we would acquire immunity that way. Now that doesn't always work out, but it did work out for, you know, big things like measles and uh, rubella and uh, all the other stuff that we used to get back in those days. Well, nowadays, uh, we, we have more options and we have this option of, you know, acquiring immunity through the vaccine. Now, we all know or, or we've heard or we've experienced maybe personally that COVID vaccinations to date are not really uh, like other vaccinations, you know, like a, uh, you know, like a measles vaccine or uh, your polio vaccine or whatever. And so people online will say, well, you know, if, if I got a polio vaccine and I still got polio, you know, I'd be kind of mad at the vaccine. Uh, and, and that indeed is the sort of, that's what happens with the COVID vaccines. So then the selling point in the COVID vaccines has always been, well, they help you acquire immunity. And if you keep getting your boosters, you acquire a little bit more immunity each time. And so when you do get an infection and everyone now says, well, we never said it was going to stop the infections. Is there any actual science on this? And is there actually any science on my likelihood of being sick and dying if I got the immunity the other way, which is through getting an infection? And so there have been a few papers, but most of the science so-called around, well, you're less likely to get uh, you know, sick and die if you've been vaccinated was conjecture and just sort of, you know, kind of wishful thinking that got published. Well, there's a pair of papers and I will, I will link both of these. And so one of the papers by Andrews et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine, 
uh, and its uh, duration of protection against mild and severe disease of COVID-19 by vaccines. And so, um, you know, basically in their summary and their conclusion, uh, we observe limited waning in vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 related hospitalization and death. So bad outcomes uh, at 20 weeks or more after vaccination. Uh, waning was greater in older adults and, and in those in a high risk group. So while it does help you uh, to be immunized, there is, there's always waning with any immunization or even post infectious activity. Well, then there was, and this is a preprint, but I'll, I'll put a link to it because very interesting science. Uh, and I'm going to try and pronounce the lead author, Shemitali, uh named correctly, Dr. Shemitali et al. It's a lot of authors on these. Duration of immune protection of SARS-CoV-2 by natural infection. So what if you just got COVID like most of us have once or twice already, regardless of vaccine you know, history? Well, they have found now in their research the same thing as with vaccination. Natural infection uh, protects against reinfection, but that does wane over time. Uh, and um, protection against severe infections remains strong. So a nice thing with your natural infection is whether you got your immune immunity through the vaccine or natural infection or a combo, you have about the same level of protection moving forward, again, not against getting another infection, but against severe disease. So now we can say using data that the acquiring of the disease, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, millions of folks have had in the world, is as effective, if not more, than the vaccine is at preventing severe disease and death. Why is this important? Well, number one, many of us have had you know, COVID once, twice, three times, regardless of vaccination status. So there's a lot of people with uh, COVID history. But the next thing is, um, if we have this building uh, immune protection against severe disease, that also tends to protect us against things like post-COVID, et cetera. Now, you can still have mild COVID and have bad post-COVID. And I've got other videos on that. We'll go look at that. They'll, they'll be linked below. But um, the bottom line is, is that whatever way you got your immunity, whether it was via an infection or two infections or three infections with COVID or uh, via your vaccines or via some combo, you're going to have more durable immunity that goes on and the immunity that goes forward will likely be more T cell than B cell. And again, I'll have videos linked on T and B cell immunity. And <clears throat> if the data pans out in that preprint about natural immunity, then it would seem to indicate that uh, natural immunity might be even a little bit more durable than vaccine-based immunity, but they both are very helpful. So I think that that's an important thing to put out there. And I really wanted to report on the natural immunity part because that's something that we've, we've not had good science on. I mean, it makes sense. That's how immunology works. I get an infection and I develop some sort of resistance to it, even if I still get reinfected. Um, so it turns out that you know normal human immunobiology still works out pretty well, uh, regardless of uh, how we acquire that. And, and the other reason I want to put that up is that there's a lot of folks and, you know, you, you do what you need to do. Remember, I always say, don't, you know, take your healthcare advice directly from people on TV or YouTube or whatever, because that'd be dumb. Uh, this is a, just information. You got to talk this over with your healthcare team but you need to do whatever you need to do to feel protected. If you're immune compromised and you're around a lot of people, it's probably not a bad idea to, you know, mask up and you use a good mask, uh, you know, like a KN95, et cetera, um, if you're immune compromised. But we, we've done that forever with our immune compromised cancer patients when they're around other people before COVID, right? This is not an unusual idea. Uh, generally speaking, if you're, uh, immune compromise and just walking around outside, no one's around you. You don't probably need to mask, talk to your doctor, but you know, I don't know how you would be exposed to anything just walking around in the middle of nowhere. 
Uh, and I see people all the time, you know, alone in their car or walking down the street and they've got a mask on, you know, unless you're wearing it for some other reason, it's unlikely to help you there. Uh, but if, you know, if you need to do that, if you need to isolate because you're immune compromised, you know, the more immune compromised you are, the older you are, the more careful you got to be. Okay. So do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Talk it because we're all different. You know, you have three people the same age, but different immune status different history with COVID or vaccines or whatever, three different targets for COVID, right? Um, so I personally am not of the mind that a lot of people are that this is death and devastation and we totally screwed up by lifting all of the, um, you know, all of our uh, environmental controls and masking and all that stuff. I, I don't think that that makes a lot of sense at this point, and most other people don't. Uh, but there is a core of healthcare providers that are very seriously, you know, saying this is very dangerous. And if we don't go back to masking, don't go back to all these restrictions, uh, you know, we're going to have more and more dead people. And it, it's, I don't see it panning out that way, but that's just my opinion. You shouldn't base anything on my opinion. Um, so those are some updates. Uh, we talked about kind of the fear media. We talked about some of the papers being written more in the public uh, side. Um, and I've got links to those. We talked about TNB cell immunity. We talked about the lack of herd immunity and how that's never going to be a real big thing. It's, it's going to be there in the background, but it'd be like herd immunity to the common cold. You're, that's a dicey roll every year. Um, we talked about how once we get to Omicron specific boosters, probably we'll be on to a different variation of the virus anyway. So, um, you know, good luck with that. And then uh, the final thing I wanted to update on, and we've got some time left, so I want to get into that, was some uh, new information on post-COVID. So in regard to post-COVID, there have been a couple of things, and I will link, uh, I've got a really great video link from a hyperbaric researcher and clinician Dr. Paul Harch that I'll put into the show notes. Again, those will be on the uh, YouTube show notes uh, in the in the comments below or in the uh, the show date details below. Um, and then there's a brand new uh, publication in Nature, one of the most respected uh, scientific journal groupings, and it's about hyperbaric oxygen therapy improves neurocognitive function and symptoms in post-COVID conditions. Uh, and it's a randomized controlled trial. So it's uh, at the high end of the evidence base that we have, you know, for uh, evidence of, uh, uh, of anything in science. And so they took people and uh, they randomized uh, 73 patients. And so randomization is supposed to also kind of statistically take some of the, uh, you know, some of the, um, variability and getting the data correct out of it. So you don't know when you go in, you say, yes, I'll be part of study. You don't know whether you're going to placebo side or the treatment side. Uh, so that's what they did. And they had, uh, you know, 37 with treatment, 36 with no, uh, with a sham treatment. So it's not no treatment. It's a treatment that was a placebo H bot. And what they did uh, was they did five days a week uh, for 40 sessions. And, uh, so if you, you know, if you count that up, you got five days a week. So that's eight weeks of uh, hyperbaric every day. And so you either got a real hyperbaric treatment or you got a, a sham you know, placebo treatment. And I looked up because sometimes the sham treatments and hyperbaric studies are done in a way where they're not actually a sham and that becomes a problem. But this actually did a really nice job. And I won't get into how they set the study up, but they did a very good job uh, because the results were very, um, I believe, remarkable. So in this, you know, small but human randomized controlled trial of 40 hyperbaric treatments, uh, they had, and these are all statistically significant. So they're all um, the numbers when they were looked at and reassessed, come out with a p value that's low enough to, to indicate statistical significance, meaning that they probably did see an effect. It wasn't random. Uh, so in areas of post COVID syndrome, uh, such as uh, global cognitive function, attention, executive functions, so big, big time things, 
those improved uh, quite a bit over placebo. Uh, significant improvement in uh, energy and sleep, really big, uh, because you know those are probably two of the uh, bigger complaints we get past the brain stuff with post-COVID uh, is energy and sleep. And then uh, the uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms. So that would be anything in the you know, anxiety, depression, agitation, you know, any of those things that you get. Um, decreases in pain, very statistically significant there. And um, also uh, improvements in objective findings. So brain MRI perfusion and things. Um, and, and so this is really a very positive. It matches what we've seen clinically. And um, it also matches, you know, my experience with post-COVID patients and uh, hyperbaric oxygen as one of the strategies. Now, I wanted to talk for just a moment about hyperbaric oxygen in that um, it's a modality that I teach about a lot. And it's a modality that I use in practice and I refer people for. My personal, now this was done as a very good study where you use one intervention, that's great. My personal experience with hyperbaric oxygen is like with a lot of other medical interventions where it really works better if you combine it with other synergistic therapies. So if you go back and I'll put uh, one of my uh, post-COVID talks, you can go to my YouTube channel, look at all the post-COVID talks if you want. I'll put a link down there for uh, one of them. Um, if, you, if you go back and look, what I'm always advocating for first is, is good diagnosis with post-COVID. And I did uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, this uh, uh, talk about the controversy in the research over what is post-COVID, where does it come from and all that business. Um, so there's that. But basically, you want good assessment on the front end. You need somebody who's used to working with it and who's not just going to refer you to a bunch of specialists. Now, as I always say, if your doctor refers you to specialists because you're sick and you've got post-COVID or anything, go, to, go see a specialist. Because what the specialist will do is make sure you don't have a major organic disease. For example, you didn't develop a uh, cardiac abnormality secondary to COVID or, uh, or an endocrine abnormality or something like that. But what happens to a lot of people is they go to the specialist and there's no big pathology. So they're sent back to their primary care. And at that point, you usually need to find, you know, either your primary care is getting more used to post-COVID or you need to find someone else. And so I think that what's important there is hyperbaric oxygen is much more available now than it used to be. There are uh, lower and higher pressure systems now, this research was done with a two atmosphere, a higher pressure system, uh, but we have seen similar results with lower 1.3 to 1.5 atmosphere systems, but really it's a tool. So if you try, it's like if you try and build a house with just a hammer, you're, when, you're, when you're hitting nails, it's going to be great. If you're trying to cut wood, the hammer is not going to work real well. So think of hyperbaric oxygen, just like nutrient therapies and other stuff. It's, it's a tool. What we tend to do is first assess the patient and find out, make sure there's no organic disease, make sure that the hormone system is normal. Uh, we talked about that another thing, make sure there haven't been reactivated infections, especially viral and other infections. Make sure that there's not active toxic things like mold exposure, stuff like that. And then once we get that data, then we put the people into uh, various types of treatment to help with their post COVID. And definitely if you can use um, hyperbaric oxygen in your post COVID treatment, now we have you know, some pretty good hard science that says it's definitely gonna improve things. And my experience is on top of all those good benefits, including perfusion to your brain and stuff, um, the hyperbaric can be an extreme synergist with other therapies that your healthcare provider might do. And you can go back again and look at some of my post-COVID uh, things that I've done and you know, take a look at what we're talking about there. But the research on the hyperbaric uh, is very, very compelling with respect to post-COVID syndrome. And I will link uh, the, both the YouTube video about it and 
the actual uh, link to the publication in Nature uh, in the show notes down below. Now, uh, again, just to reiterate with respect to um, where the show notes are and what, what to do, when we put this over on YouTube, so right now we're live stream on Facebook and we're CTR Radio uh, Live, and we will be audio on all any pod burner. Look for Medicine and Health with Dr. Paul Anderson on any pod burner, and you'll find me. Uh, and then we move the video audio combo over to YouTube. So down in the notes underneath, there will be all of these links. If you're on your phone, on the lower right hand side, there's a little upside down V or a little V. It's actually right side up. Click that and that'll open up the drop down. If you're on your computer, a bigger device uh, on the left side, it'll say show more or more. Click on that. You'll get in there. And like I said, we've got uh, these are the actual show notes. There's quite a few links for you. So all of the public media. So the news stories I talked about are going to be on there. The scientific research papers are going to be on there that we talked about. Uh, links uh, to myself and other uh, other scientists and physicians who have looked into the science on different things that are related to today's topic will all be there as well. And then, uh, like I see these new HBOT, the new hyperbaric oxygen uh, resources will be there. So um, that will be there. I think that will be very useful to you if you want to dig into any of these things. And if you just want, you know, like I say, um, I like to mix it up. If there are good resources that are not you know, a peer reviewed science, you'll know that because it's, it's a news story, et cetera. But news stories can be useful to kind of uh, summarize things and they'll give you links to other stuff. And so if you're interested in, you know, some of these topics, like why haven't we and why aren't we going to hit a real herd immunity? Beyond what I said, there's some great stuff in there. Um, you know, how overblown are the doom and gloom sort of reports that we're seeing? some great uh, stuff and some news reports in there as well. Um, and then, you know, a lot of other resources from uh, other, you know, people who I trust, who I believe look at the science in as open handed and critical a way as possible. Um, and uh, I think are, are doing a good job of reporting on data, you know, much beyond what the things that we got into here today. The other thing I did put in are a couple of links um, around COVID uh, therapies and then COVID and nutrients. And we talked a lot about them and we're kind of running out of time today. But remember that because we're living in, you know, this time where COVID now has uh, evolved a lot and it's continuing to all evolve rapidly, COVID doesn't care whether you've been vaccinated or not, doesn't even care if you've had the disease before or not. Yes previous disease, previous vaccination, make it less likely you'll have serious disease. So that's great. Both previous disease, previous vaccine, either way, seems like you have less severe disease, uh, but you still can get sick. I mean, like I said, look at, you know, Justin Trudeau and probably a bunch of people, you know, fully vaccinated, and, you know, yeah, COVID twice, you know, for, for many people, myself, I've had COVID, uh, I had the original Wuhan strain from China. I was in China and got it. Uh, and then I, I got Omicron later. So I, the original Wuhan strain seemed to protect me pretty good for a while. Uh, but, you know, it happens. So nutrients and other things can be very useful to you. Now, I've seen people making fun of all that. on, But if you go and you look and you especially look through some of the things I've done on the science about vitamin D and infections and other stuff, um, it, it's not just made up stuff. Like there's actually science on these things and you can take a look at it. Um, again, if you're going to do a lot of nutrient therapy, work with somebody who knows how to get in the direction of things to ask your healthcare providers about things I have seen to be helpful. And again, beyond hyperbaric, if you're looking into um, post COVID things, I've got a couple of links in the uh, show notes that are coming up when we put this over on YouTube. And uh, I also, uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a number of post COVID videos in there that you can take a look at, but that is all the time we have today for medicine and health with Dr. Paul Anderson. So we're coming to you live right now from the CTR radio network, which is my home base for all of these things. 
And then, like I said, we will be putting this over on all the pod burners. So if you like to listen or we will go over on YouTube and that'll all happen in the coming couple of days. But all of the show notes are going to be on YouTube in the in the area below. So please, if you're on YouTube or any of the pod burners, you know, like, share, subscribe. That really helps out the YouTube communities growing. Uh, and then check out everybody else on CTR Radio Network. You got some great hosts on there. Okay, we are done for today because I've bumped up against overtime. So I will see you all next week on the radio or on YouTube anytime. 